This podcast contains an English accent that most of our Irish listeners will find offensive. Also, there may be some colourful language that you're going to find less offensive. Now, over to Ryan and Leon. Enjoy the podcast. How you doing over there with your underwear on your face? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again. This is Ryan. That is Leon. That am, was Leon. I am Leon. It is me. Singing <laughs> sweet melodies. I really enjoyed it, I have to say. Thank you. That was off the cuff, would you believe? I didn't rehearse that all day. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> How have you been, Ryan, baby? I've been good. i tell you what, we were just saying earlier on, um, it's been just... Mind blown for the amount of um, people that have been getting in touch and sending in poems, and I just thank us everybody for giving this whatever it is a, f- a follow and a listen because it's just been incredible the amount of support that this podcast is getting. So man, thank thank you so much, everybody. Shout out to me, Ma, who actually listened to the podcast, and I actually believe she did. She didn't just say that because she loves me, and there's other people as well that got involved as well. Like, and obviously, you know, you set something new and you think. You hope that people will listen. Yeah, but you hope it's something. Absolutely blown away by how many people that are getting in, getting in touch. And new writers as new well. Writers. That's what we want. Like we just got a message just there from someone who was like, "Oh, fair play for the podcast. I've just started writing seven months ago. Um, wanted to send these in and just sent me two poems. Amazing. What, what, what else do you bloody want? Like that is it. That yeah. we've won. <laughs> I had somebody send me a poem only the other day, and it was um they'd never shared any of their work before and they were like my heart is beating so fast in my chest send this to you and I was like thank you so much for having the courage to send that and it's a brilliant piece of work and I was like but people are confiding in, in us and like you know people that would never share their work to other people and, and like I feel it's absolute privilege it's a fucking privilege it's yeah. a bloody privilege so for anybody who sent us an email liked it shared it we, we're eternally grateful um, on to this week's episode we're, the juicy in, bits. we're into the second episode. It feels like kind of like we've done the first date and we've had incredible sex. Oh, yeah. Smoking <laughs> cigarettes And afterwards. now we've decided to go for a sober dinner. And we're sussing. <laughs> we're in the sus phase. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, hope, I hope that um, this sussing out phase goes well between us and you. We're recording this the, the week of... The passing of, of Anne Delaney, mm. who was um, a former nurse who was living homeless uh, on Andrew Street for a, many a year, I think, and she passed away earlier in the week, and we want to talk about her, and yeah. we will, because um, there's a beautiful story of her passion for poetry, which I didn't know about. We're going to talk about, and um, we had a lovely listener send us a, a question about happiness. So we're going to talk about like what that means, and what it means to be sad and happy through mm. the through, through poetry Ho- hopefully that's going to help somebody if they're listening but I'll, I'll, let's start with um, we're talking about the people that, that we love like we usually do I'm going to start by talking about John Cooper Clark. oh god yeah yeah I the waited OG. two episodes oh. to talk about John Cooper Clark. sweating <laughs> he's putting on his leather jacket I have I I've got me I've got me uh, buffooned <laughs> <laughs> i got me scarf on I just I love this guy I love John Cooper Clark, and I'm so glad that He's now burst ab- above lit- literary scenes and poetry scenes, and he's now. I think everybody's like he's probably the most well-known poet currently, isn't he? He's, he's, inst- he's an institution, yeah. basically. Yeah. As soon as I realised he was going to be in the consciousness of the of the public, uh, Cat was uh, when he was on eight, eight out of ten cats oh. doing doing his work, and I was just like, <laughs> and then just seeing people respond to how I've always responded to him like Sean Locke and Jimmy Carr just watching him do poems that are funny that are really funny I was like thank fuck that that guy has now I think he was always big in the scene but like your people run of the mill people who are in the pub are now saying oh look have a a poet that I like and it's John Cooper Clark I love his poem The Ritz The the Ritz yeah it's so good I think that's the poem that he performed Bernard Manning, oh, who was a. I mean, n- nowadays you just know Bernard Manning as like a racist comedian. But, <laughs> but in the in the north of England, he would have been a big event organizer. He ran like the working men's clubs and stuff, and he gave 
John Cooper Clarke's first gigs. Really? Yeah, very in the cool. The 70s, was it? Yeah, 70s. 70s and yeah. then he went on to uh, open up for bands. Okay. Uh, and then now, I guess he's just he's just well known. And uh, what I love about him is, well, accessibility, his language, yeah. simple, funny. He's somewhere between an observational comic and a social commentator. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he's got some brilliant poems, but they're about topics that if he wasn't, if he wasn't funny, it wouldn't be funny. Yeah. Great poem in his latest collection called What is called Stay Out of Jail Gas. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just a guide on the things that Gaz needs to stop doing to stay out of jail. But if that was someone else, it could be something that like would be quite serious. Like, well, you know, stay away from that thing and, and don't do this. But John Cooper Clark, he just turns it into like, right, I'm going to make this funny to land it even harder. Than it would if it wasn't that funny. Do you think that because he uses kind of humour, he can touch more sensitive topics and get into kind oh, of Oh yeah, more... talks yeah. And I think I think actually as well, he uses his comic timing to get through to the people that he'd hope would read it. Like I think he yeah. hopes a gas is reading it. Well, the down. thing is because it's like, because it's it's approachable and it's so accessible, I think that a gas would read it. Rather than someone who uses my favourite word in the whole English link dictionary is superfluous words. People that mm-hmm. avoid superfluous words and use common you know, everyday colloquial language is the active but avoid every day, superfluous words by the way good, yeah. as well. Like fuck that. But I love the word superfluous, I'll still use that, but I won't use superfluous words in my own poetry. But you know what I mean? It's, it's like if you make it in, if you make it engaging for the everyday person then more people will read it and you have a you have a larger reach than if you kind of within a smaller circle of Do you know what I mean? Like, but, I know exactly what you mean. And just just on that, there's a great poem that he did uh, called um Get get back on drugs, you fat fuck. <laughs> and again, it's a poem that's like it's about it's about how the people that try to get sober are held back back by the mates. That's what it is. Yeah. So that is not a funny topic. Have you ever have you ever been in a have you ever been in a pub and tell people that you're not drinking? And you get the glare. You get the people that someone they don't trust you. Just, yeah. And then you, and you have to get the, you, even if you're not driving, you have to bring car keys with you. Just be like, I'm driving, and that's the only. Or you're pregnant. It's either you're pregnant or you're driving or both, and they let you away. But other than that, they're like, ah, but you'll have one. Yeah, you'll have one. So like the safety in bad decisions in numbers, isn't it? Mm. I think that's maybe what that is. But yeah, I have been in places like that. They're like, leave the car. Leave the car here. No, because it's in town and the parking's fucking horrendous. So leave like, me alone. I'll get the car clamped and towed away. No, no, just leave the car. I have that one point. <laughs> <laughs> this is a. I'm, I'm going to share a poem with you. This is um in the same ilk, really. So this is John Cooper Clark's take on getting older. I can't wait to hear it. It's called Bed Blocker Blues. What me worry, I should care, shit for brains, wire for hair, I seen the future and I ain't there, things are gonna get worse, velcro slippers and a spandex waistband, washed up on planet wasteland, zipped up like a nylon spaceman, things are gonna get worse, things are gonna get worse nurse, things are gonna get rotten. Make that hearse reverse, nurse. I'm trying to remember everything that I've forgotten. A menace in the box. I was good in the air. Now I can't get up from an easy chair. The doctor told me, oh yeah, things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. Things are going to get crappy. Colour me perverse, nurse. Bad news always makes me happy. The money's gone. There's only muck. Social services pass the book. How bad does it have to suck? Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. Things are going to get dismal. Smite me with a curse, nurse. Make it something real abysmal. All that's left is the taste of soup. Afternoon reruns of F Troop. And a painful frame with a built-in stoop. Things are going to get worse. Things are going to get worse, nurse. I ain't optimistic. Struck down by inertia, nurse. In a bungalow smelling of piss and biscuits. Life's a bitch. It's a bit rich. Doubled up with a permanent stitch. Any kind of effort will be so last ditch. Things are going to get worse. 
young people make me swear you can't take me anywhere i'm like a breath of stale air a walking one man medical scare things are gonna get worse hail seizure hello stroke so many pills a bloke could choke i can't decide from what to croak things are gonna get worse things are gonna get worse nurse murder by logistics take me back to the first verse the last one's just too pessimistic euthanasia that sounds good a neutral alpine neighborhood then back to britain or dressed in wood things are gonna get worse brilliant fucking bill brilliant isn't it amazing. That? brilliant amazing oh my god wow <laughs> <laughs> That was Bed Block of Blues by uh, John Cooper Clark, taken from um, The Luckiest Guy Alive. Um, Leon, we, we're going to go back to, I mean, way back when. Well, yeah, so yeah. this uh, poet was actually recommended to me by a friend. Mm. Um, we were speaking earlier about how the beauty of this podcast is that people are reaching out and, and giving us kind of... Sending inspira- things in. Yeah, exactly, inspiration. So... I'd never heard of this poet before. I read the poem and I kind of did a bit of digging just to kind of find out more about it. But this poem is called James Clarence Mangan and was like a scrivener, a scrivener, a scrivener, a scrivener. I don't even know what that means, but also as a journalist, yeah, which I know it means. Yeah, so he was <laughs> scrivener, a scrivener. I love the one of my favorite words already. Right? A scrivener, yeah. Basically, he was. Um, 16 years of drudgery some of his poems attract the attention of two gentlemen who procured him for a position in Trinity College Library and by this time Mangan was suffering the pangs of unrequited love as they say and having been encouraged by his intentions by the mysterious Francis Mm. don't know who Francis is but I suppose he was turned down he was also had a family that sponged on him relentlessly and um, there's a this is I'm reading from an article written by the Irish Times 1931 about about um, um, perhaps one will sympathise with the unfortunate genius who became a confirmed drug taker. So he obviously fell into unfortunate pattern yeah. and died in, as I said, eighteen forty nine. But he died as a as a pauper in Meath Hospital, so in Dublin. And Oof. it's a tragic it's, life it's, that sounds. It's a fall from you know it's a tragic fall. But there's a poem, his most famous poem, or one of his most famous poems, is called the Nameless One, and which I'd love to read for you. Yeah, love to hear and it. Bro. It's so the nameless one roll forth my song like a rushing river that sweeps along to the mighty sea God will inspire me while I deliver my soul of thee tell thou the world my bones lie whitening amid the last homes of youth and eld that there once was one whose veins ran lightning no I beheld Tell how his boyhood was one drear night hour, how shunned for him through his grief and gloom. No star of all heaven sends to light our path to the tomb. Roll on my song into after ages, tell how disdaining all earth could give. He would have taught men from wisdom's pages the way to live. And tell how trampled the riot it hated and worn by weakness, disease and wrong. He fled for shelter to God who made it his soul with song. With song that always sublime or vapid flowed like a rill in the morning beam, perchance not deep but intense and rapid, a mountain stream. Tell how this nameless, condemned for years, long too heard with demons from hell beneath, Saw things that made him with groans and tears long for even death. Go on to tell how with genius wasted, betrayed in friendship, be fooled in love. With spirit shipwrecked and young hopes blasted, he still, still strove. Till spent with toil, dreeing death for others, and some whose hands should have wrought for him. If children lived not for sires and mothers, his mind grew him and he fell far through the pit of abysmal the gulf and grave of magan and burns and pawned his soul for the devil's dismal stock of returns and yet redeemed it in days of darkness and shapes and signs of the final wrath 
when death in hideous and ghastly starkness stood on his path and tell how now amid wreck and sorrow and want and sickness and houseless nights he bids in calmness the silent morrow that no ray lights and lives he still then yes old and hoary at thirty-nine from despair and woe he lives enduring what future story will never know him grant a grave to ye pitying noble deep in your bosoms there let him dwell he too had tears for all sorrows and trouble here and in hell just listen to that i just i i thought i was listening to someone who was at the end was at the end mm. of his of his life but he he was 37 it was 39 I think 39 it? imagine feeling that way imagine feeling like you want to tell the world your kind of self portrait through mm. those words and not have even reached what we would consider like half life like yeah. middle age although you know some of the language is it's it's not a it's not timeless caught up in history you know it's, you can it's tell not, where it's where, yeah you can tell it's dated like last a bit, week you know. we did the american poet from about the same time so that's what we say the language is yeah. in, in our irish and english you always feel like you know where when it was <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly and but like the the imagery and the meaning like the bones lie whitening what a fucking line that's yeah. is he wanting some kind of forgiveness from someone who would later know who he was and they kind of go. I was. I was someone who had something about me. There's a great Nietzsche quote, and it's like, "Don't." You know, I'm paraphrasing here, but don't stare too long into the abyss because the abyss starts to stare into you. Right. This is a man that's looked over the edge. Yeah. And he knows that it's coming. Keep it light. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Alex. for staying with us for this long. If you're still on, uh, I'm about to jump off the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> No, Leon, thank you for sharing that, mate. Thank you. Um, well, um, we'll talk. Well, let's well let's talk now about the, just the week that we've had here, and and Andalani's story, and some of, some of the, the the moments that I've been like kind of reading about, and some of the comments about how she was with people that passed her, and I, I, I but I want to start with like you, mate. Like you seem to be someone who doesn't have any kind of um not i wouldn't say fear but like a lot of people have a a natural kind of i don't know whether it's like hesitancy to help people in like the homeless and people that Mm. on the street you seem to you have a few poems we'll we'll, hopefully you'll share one of them later about people that are on their you know having hard times and living rough i want to find a bit more about what you think about that that like human i wouldn't say it's even human it's inhuman really that kind of disposition that that kind of gap that people like to leave between the people that sleep rough and, and the homeless and I think that it's it's easier to see them as non entities than to look at someone in such tragic circumstances and see them as a human being and think that that's somebody's daughter or son, someone's ma, someone's dad, someone's it's easier to kind of say, Oh well, they're just they're on drugs and they're they're down and outs and it's their choice rather than a cataclysm of circumstances that have kind of come together or a freak tragedy that might one thing might have happened in their life that might have spurned this spiral heartbreaking and it seems that the city that we're in at the moment it seems to be growing for some you know with i don't know how i think you know our economy seems to be doing all right but yet there's more homeless people than ever and it's heartbreaking to see you know but I think that's a really profound thing to to say that not ignorance is bliss, but having that trigger of well, it's it's not it's nothing to do with me because they're they've done something they've done something wrong they've made a bad choice they've made a bad choice is like a narrative that we that we think like they've they could have chosen the light but they didn't and so that means that they're not part of my world they're in another world an underworld even of like a class that i don't need to to even say hello to or speak to but there's an interesting thing you said there it's like people see as if it's a choice and it's not a choice no for many many people they're born into a world that 
everything is stacked against them and it's not a choice no very very tough and I guess, I guess like the stories that we've been hearing about Antelaine like she found great like, love in giving people that helped her notes and if you're seeing this by Instagram and Facebook ton of people saying that like I met Anne once she was so lovely she gave me a poem she wrote me a poem once I still have it even some guy said that my nanny has a poem in her house that she wrote no way yeah isn't that incredible so even like in that world where it's so feels like it must feel like you can't get out of it she was using poetry as a way to spread hope somebody who's in such certain kind of circumstances and like yeah like poetry can be a beacon of hope yeah a small gesture woman who was given the change out of someone's pocket and was given you know, she, in return she gives something back yeah and it's art and you, you know you, you think almost that in you know in, in your situation when you're like that that like your light will be extinguished your life or hope will be extinguished and you just kind of it, it's gone you don't it's, have any you don't have any light there's yeah. no light left and yet she still kept that kind of flame burning a little bit by this little gesture of kind of passing on poems I, I just I just couldn't believe when I was reading that that's what she was doing I tracked one down um a short one actually that I, that I wanted to share with you oh, so don't. um I found someone who um had said that she was written a really small thank you note and on the thank you note just three lines and it just said the problem the problem is there is no problem and the story goes that this person who helped Anne just visibly was having a really bad day and seemingly had in some way in that short back and forth of like can you get me a paper or can you get me a coca cola had shown Anne that she was having a rough day so in that spare minute where this person was going around Tesco oh you was getting the stuff she'd, she'd written this for her wow yeah and for three lines like, it, it does bear so much weight doesn't it? it there's layers to that sentence I think from someone who's homeless and I don't think Anne meant any of the layers that I kind of have expanded it to so what, but what I did is I took those words and I wanted to kind of write something that um, would be reflective of like maybe our life of privilege and, and like kind of not having too much struggle but we like to mm. complain about things so I, I wrote a short poem I, I wanted to share it with you if that's alright pal yeah please do um, the poem that I wrote is called there is no problem the bulb's gone there's no more bread I never get enough time in bed. Managers at me and wrecking my head. The problem is, there is no problem. And that's the problem, that is. Weekend wine means a Monday lost. Another newspaper crossword not crossed. How much are those new tiles going to cost? The problem is, there is no problem. And that's the problem, that is. Too much noise around my flat. The coffee shop staff didn't fancy a chat. I get thin, then fat, then thin, then fat. The problem is... There is no problem, and that's the problem that is. In a Western metro modern day, it's important to be pissed at everything that I think's to blame for the opportunities I've missed. Where the world is full of people that have too many issues for a list, I remain to moan and grump and sigh, when in reality, my life is the dream for someone else whose life took an unexpected twist. I hope Anne's somewhere up there listening. I hope she. I hope she'd like. She'd have liked it. Yeah. Like, did Did you know anyone that was homeless? Like, I know because when I first met you, um, I heard you do a poem that you're gonna do now about about the homeless, mm. and I just wonder, like, did Did you know somebody that was homeless, or do you just have that? Um. So, for many years, I worked in town. You'd see people every single day that other people wouldn't. And you'd be walking up and down the street and there was like say for instance there's one particular gentleman I'd always see and he'd always say that he was uh, he just needed a couple of euro he was trying to get a bus to Carlo and every time you'd see him he was always getting that bus to Carlo but every single time you'd see him he'd look progressively worse and mm. it's just these faces that you'd see all the time and some faces you'd never see again and some faces you wouldn't see for years and then you'd see them again so you know Working in town, going around all the places, especially like, you know the boardwalk, the Rosie Hacker Bridge, and stuff like that. Yeah, you'd see all these faces, and I think, uh, like you were saying earlier about that that gap between like who's who's a real person who 
isn't a real person hopefully what you're about to share will close that gap but to be around town most days conniving and skiving yet still striving along singing a song my chemical induced haze I did be around town most days in the sun having fun with the best of bally our fingless and the moon cast out and passed out in this town that doesn't take in strays I did be around town most days Sipping from flagons of broken dreams or could have been and memories of before things seemed to come apart at the seams or they'd be around town most days. Sitting broken and smoking alone with nothing but the scars of pain with only a gansey on decked out in the pissings of rain they find people like me dead on the ground most days. Because to you it might seem strange a stranger asking for nothing but a bit of change in this country of broken systems and closed doors and people sleeping out on empty floors or they'd be round town most days. In a place where we choose bankers over human beings a load of wankers who deem us less than the bottom line don't be worrying they're over 18 they'll be fine or they'd be round town most days. Where the hostel is so hostile that it's safer to sleep out on the streets as long as we keep away from where the politicians meet. People don't want me around most days. The young and old are all the same. But it's what we're told is the real thing to blame. It's a choice they chose this life to live with, strife to survive by needle or knife. I'd be round town most days. We have children of the system systematically spat out sporadically to the world as soon as they come of age. Icily isolated with but their rage towards a world that has let them down and they said they should be hidden underground in this invisible town. But the have-nots have got nowhere to go and instead their struggles are out there on show. I'd be feeling quite down most days. People forget that this won't go away. And these invisible children are still here to stay until the cycle is fixed won't cure itself and shall continue to exist so don't sit there and tell me that things are going grand because homeless are people too that just need a hand I hope we turn things around someday Okay, cool. So we got a really short uh, message from one of our listeners on Instagram. And I guess like, the way I read it is now changed to, to how I now read it. So I'll read you, I'll read you out the question and see what you think. Please the, do. The question was, are you happier than are sad? Are you happier than are sad? It's an interesting choice of wording. Isn't it? Yeah. Like it's acknowledging that sadness is a thing and happiness is also a thing. So, you know, I, I, I wonder what you think about that. It swings and roundabouts. Everybody kind of goes through, like the pendulum swings, I suppose. It's more like a pendulum swings. You need to have, it's okay to have bad days. I think with the, with the rise of social media, everybody seems to have only good days. And everyone's so fucking great. And everyone's always happy. And you're only shown your accomplishments and how well you're doing and how happy you are and how good your children are and how beautiful your husband is and how amazing your dog is. Yeah. But they never see like, oh, I'm feeling a bit shit today. You know, I'm, I'm finding it difficult to get out of bed. And I think with the rise of that and the more people spend online, they're not being truthful to themselves, I suppose. Because when you're, say, imagine, right, say the hypothetical scenario, you wake up in the morning, you're in bed, you're having a bit of a shit day, you go on your phone and everybody's having a fucking great day. That, that is rough when that happens. And you think everybody's having the best time ever and I'm fucking miserable. And then if you're not seeing people that are having a good day, you're seeing people telling you how to protect yourself from a bad day. Yeah. <laughs> are you are you feeling shit right now? <laughs> shit. Well, you should probably do this. This will help you. Five top tips to not have a fucking terrible day. <laughs> and you're there having a shit time. And you're like, how Both do I do them, but awful. <laughs> It's true though. It's That's like, the reality of having shit days. You don't need either. But I think when you're having a, like you should have shit days because when you have good days, you appreciate having a good day. When you're having a good moment, you appreciate it because you have shit days and you're like, right, last week I felt fucking terrible yeah. and now I'm having a very good time and I'm just going to enjoy this time. Whereas if everyone had a great time all the time, it'd be fucking boring. Yeah, it would be boring. 
do you know what would you, what do you think like about the, about the same same actually I've, I've a, I have a poem that kind of reflects exactly what you just said so I'm just going to go into it this is from a guy that I really like um, he's a poet called uh, Brian Bilston it's called Serenity Prayer send me a slow news day a quiet subdued day in which nothing much happens of note just the passing of time the consumption of wine and a rerun of murder she wrote Grant me a no news day, a spare me your views day, in which nothing happens at all. A few hours together, some regional weather, a day we can barely recall. And that's it, isn't it? That's it. That's it. More does she roll. But that's like what you said, isn't it? Like you've, you've got to face the fact that you're going to have a shit time now and again. And when you go into that fire, when you're not in the fire, you have a, a sensitivity to when you are really content and you're able to really live in those moments basically it's okay to have a shit day you're not a freak if you have one no and when you have a good day make sure you fucking enjoy it yeah and, and to, the, to the contributor to the to the to the person that sent that in um, yeah whenever you're having great days just fucking lean in yeah. really lean in and really indulge in it because you have to that's it um, Leon thank you so much for your company you too always a pleasure never a chore <laughs> Uh, as always um, give us a follow um, like the podcast leave a review if you like I've never done that I don't know if you've left a review for never. anything in your life food but... reviews food reviews I have <laughs> cut yeah. chips were cold I don't think I've ever left a food service review. was fucking terrible I did you know what we'll wrap it up here I did send a letter into Channel 4 once <laughs> oh, after a, an episode of the Inbetweeners that I watched <laughs> was just a little bit too much for me and actually wrote a, wrote a lengthy letter into, into E4 dear bastards <laughs> yeah I did me and my mum actually wrote it together we were watching an episode where Neil kills the fish and uh, we were just both very upset <laughs> fish lives matter too worry. so don't write us letters we're not going <laughs> to but do send us emails and you can get us at thepoachisdeadpodcast at gmail.com as we said earlier poets poetry um, questions for our agony aunt we'd, we'd We'd love to hear from you. And don't forget to slide into those DMs as well. Yeah, do. Absolutely. Okay. Leon, thank you. Cue the outro.